In the course of history, there are few ships that come to mind just by hearing the name. Ships that you instantly know, even if you don't pay much attention to naval history. Something like Missouri, Constitution, Arizona, or Enterprise if you're American. Victory or Warspite if you're British. Mikasa or Yamato for Japan. Aurora for Russia. These ships are all historical for different reasons, for different histories, for different actions. But few are the ships that can claim to be as well known for their impact on naval design as HMS Dreadnought. Her construction, her design, these changed naval warfare more than anything before her, excluding maybe the Ironclad Revolution. No other ship would in their own right, create quite the same break until the development of proper aircraft carriers. Accepting submarines, but that's an entirely different topic. For surface warfare, there is rather a reason that we talk about battleships in context of dreadnoughts and pre-dreadnoughts. This video, however, will focus primarily on dreadnought the ship and less on the revolution she was part of, that video will come at a later date, one dedicated to the topic in more detail than I can do in a ship overview. As such, HMS Dreadnought was born out of a desire to improve on battleship design. Prior to her development, and it must be said similar developments in other countries, battleships had more or less settled on a standard kind of design concept. Some exceptions apply, of course, but in general, battleships were armed with two twin turrets, one on the bow and one on the stern. These would have a pair of heavy and slow-firing guns, most often 12 inches, but sometimes ranging higher or lower depending on the country in question. You could see 13 inches and you could see 11 inches or even 10 inches. Supporting these guns would be a wide variety of secondary and tertiary weapons of smaller caliber and faster firing rate. Some of these older style battleships would go even further and have so many different kinds of calibers, it almost feels like the designers were sticking as many guns as humanly possible on them without caring at all about logistics or logical gun layouts. The last designs prior to her completion, the King Edward VII and Lord Nelson classes, decided to have the same big gun layout, the two twin turrets but add in a bunch of nearly as large secondary guns. Prior ships would generally use 6 inches, maybe a couple bigger guns too. These ships went straight past that and into what's the biggest secondary gun we can stick on here while still having the 12 inches. You would think this would be good because you'd have bigger guns that still fire fast, even as your biggest guns are still, you know, for belt punching. The problem is, it becomes very hard to tell fall a shot apart from each other once the guns are getting so close in caliber. Once you get to about 9 inches, it's not that dissimilar from a 12 inch splash when the shell hits, at least at farther ranges. So if your 9.2 inch guns are creating water spouts that are almost indistinguishable at range from your 12 inch guns, how are you going to adjust your fire? You can't tell which shell is which, so you might have the 9.2 inches adjusting fire to go where the 12 inches are hitting, and the 12 inches may be adjusting fire to hit where the 9.2 inches are hitting, and suddenly you're just messing up all of your aim there. You have no idea where your shells are actually landing. Toss in different velocities, different rate of fire, and it becomes even more difficult. That's the issue you have with these last generation pre-dreadnoughts. Accuracy at anything but point-blank range was becoming harder and harder to maintain. Improvements in range finding hardly mattered if you weren't sure which shell was landing where. Thus was born the idea of, well, if all the guns are the same caliber, this isn't an issue. All the shells are going to be the exact same. There's also a side benefit that it increases the weight of fire you throw down range. It might not be a huge difference, but, it is important to note here that the British were not at all unique in coming to this idea. 
Both the Americans and Japanese did as well. USS South Carolina, in fact, predates Dreadnought in design and has a better gun layout. Satsuma, the Japanese equivalent, also predates Dreadnought and was designed to be equipped with only 12-inch guns. In fact, she would, had things gone according to plan, have been the first all-big-gun battleship. A lack thereof and costs left her as what would become a semi-dreadnought instead, armed with a mix of 12 and 10-inch guns. Though, just because of language conventions and the British being the big dogs, I sincerely doubt we would have been calling ships Satsumas, even had she been completed first with her original design. Ditto South Carolina and hypothetical Carolinas. All things being equal, if you want to talk big, powerful ship, Dreadnought kind of works a bit better than Satsuma or Carolina. Past these designs, there is the ever-famous ideal battleship for the British Navy from our friend Cuniberti, but that was never going to be built. For their part, the British were not unaware of these developments. Fisher, having by this point come around to all big guns instead of all small guns, knew of the South Carolina class before it was even authorized. And, putting his usual manic energy to work, he would push and push and push some more until he got through Dreadnought, though she went through multiple iterations and gun layouts to reach her final design. I'm probably actually going to go over those in a later short story video, because some of those layouts are let's just say pretty interesting in their own right. In any event, Fisher's manic energy and stealing guns from the Lord Nelsons, relegating them to completion after the ship that had obsoleted them, would see Dreadnought be constructed at a positively insane speed for a capital ship, even back then. Material was gathered well before she was laid down, several months in advance, honestly. Her actual date of being laid down October 2nd, 1905, is a bit deceptive. She had already had more work done on her than most ships would get done for months after starting their construction. Even so, the rate of construction once she was laid down is still an accomplishment that should not be ignored. Though I do feel sorry for the poor workers who had to actually do it. Because they had to work massively inflated hours. In a dry dock already famous for being fast, while employing more workers than would man dreadnoughts several times over, just to manage to get her launched within four months of being laid down. It is extremely fast to get any capital ship in the water four months after being laid down. Her actual commissioning was just as fast, being as she was commissioned in December of 1906. That's only a bit over a year after being laid down, which again, even for the time, is an incredibly fast turnaround. One that wouldn't be replicated, though it did rather serve the goal of the Royal Navy being the first to have a ship of her kind. As for the technical details of the ship, Treadnought was armed with 10 12-inch guns and 5 twin turrets. As mentioned, these were the same guns as her predecessors and the same mountings. The poor Lord Nelsons had to wait for their guns because Fisher stole them to stick on Dreadnought. In terms of layout, Dreadnought would set a standard that would be followed for some time in the Royal Navy, and to an admittedly lesser extent, abroad. Most turrets mounted on the center line, with a couple of wing turrets adding to the theoretical, remember the German videos here, overall firepower. In the Royal Navy, this was done out of worry of blast effect on the siding coats of turrets, which made them a bit adverse to super firing mounts. As a result, with one turret on the bow and two wing turrets on either flank, Dreadnought could, hypothetically, fire six guns forward, and then with her two aft turrets, plus the wing ones, she could fire eight guns to her stern. In actual practice, blast effect on the superstructure kind of limited the firing arcs of the wing turrets. South Carolina, with her super firing guns, could use a more effective broadside on less weight due to lacking wing turrets. Dreadnought lacked a secondary battery in the same sense as her predecessors and successors would see it. 
She had her main guns, and then no fewer than 28 12 pounder guns. Now, these are just anti torpedo boat guns. They're not meant for anything bigger than that. But even for that, they were already pretty small and obsolescent. These three inch weapons would have been woefully inadequate against a properly armored target, short of shooting up superstructures. But the British did see them as sufficient for deterring torpedo boats. It's rather telling, though, that they would be replaced immediately on the successor class, which is otherwise broadly identical to dreadnoughts, with 4-inch guns. And speaking of weapons of questionable utility, dreadnought also carried 5 torpedo tubes, which rarely would have seen effective use even had she been in a position to use them. As a general rule, these underwater torpedoes on battleships frankly were mostly space wasters and vulnerabilities in the anti-torpedo protection of the ships. Though they hung around for a surprisingly long time. Bismarck can tell you about that, considering what Rodney did to her. But Dreadnought didn't end there with obsolescent weapon designs, considering she had a ram bow, at a time where ramming speed was increasingly a useless thing to design for. Then again, considering the one ship she would actually sink, now with her design and construction complete, surely such a revolutionary warship the one who brought on the Dreadnought Revolution, the one who obsoleted all previous battleships. Surely she had an equally important service life. Yeah, about that. Dreadnought's actual service was pretty boring. Don't misunderstand me here. She did many important things. Her design revolutionized warship construction and galvanized other navies to follow suit. Her very name is recognized the world over, even today, as Dreadnought Battleship. And she made all previous ships pre-Dreadnoughts and the odd semi-Dreadnought. But the thing of it is, for all of this, Dreadnought didn't really see actual combat, in spite of serving in World War I. Her pre-war service career was honestly pretty standard. Flagship roles and the like. Gunnery exercises, showing the flag, training. These are all pretty typical things a ship does during peacetime. Of course, Dreadnought established quite a few records and developments in warship service. Her primitive and early fire control system helped, alongside her successors, in developing longer range gunnery. Her turbine power plant, which is what really set her aside from South Carolina and the like, proved to be quite a wise investment. Dreadnought could steam faster for longer and more efficiently than any battleship before her. It was this, more than her guns, that allowed her to dictate engagements and made her so drastically superior to pre-Dreadnoughts. And I do grant you there was the Dreadnought hoax, wherein an infamous hoaxer would convince the Royal Navy that a bunch of Abyssinian, that is, Ethiopian, royals should be given a guided tour of Dreadnought. Spoiler. There wasn't a single royal involved. Or a single African, for that matter. That's a story for a... Probably a history short story video. At any rate, come World War I, Dreadnought would... Well, miss out on all the big events. She wasn't at Gallipoli. She missed Jutland due to being in dock for a refit. The grand clash of ships descended from her. And she missed it entirely. Though, to be fair... Dreadnought was obsolescent at best by this point. Arguably, she was pushing on obsolete. You have to remember that Jutland was in 1916, a good decade after Dreadnought was commissioned. This isn't the era of you build a supercarrier and it lasts for 50 years. In the early 20th century, a decade saw ships go from 21 knot battleships with 12 inch guns and wing turrets to 23 to 25 knot ships with 15 inch guns mounted on the center line. The first two decades of the 20th century were some of the fastest and most hectic in terms of capital ship design in history. So while Dreadnought began as a revolutionary ship, she ended her service life, barring a short stint back with the Grand Fleet, leading a squadron of the ships she had made obsolete. Dreadnought and her pre-Dreadnought consorts would serve in the English Channel, 
guarding against German shore bombardment. She really was no longer state of the art because the Marshall technology had just passed her by. She would be decommissioned after the war and scrapped in 1923. And, unfortunately, very little of Dreadnought survives to this day, at least in any recognizable form. In spite of her historical significance, ships just were not seen as museums back then. Some exceptions apply. In the end, in spite of her design and what it created, the only true combat accomplishment to Dreadnought's name came from her ram bow, because she would use it to ram the German U-boat, U-29, which had surfaced directly in front of her after firing a torpedo. Dreadnought sliced that submarine in half, leaving no survivors, after almost ramming another battleship because that one was trying to do the exact same thing. It's the last of Dreadnought's famous feats in that regard. She's the only battleship to purposely sink a submarine. And she almost made it a twofer. In 1916, Dreadnought tried ramming another submarine, though she would fail this time. Can't win them all. As we come to the end, Dreadnought had a uneventful service career. But no one, no one, can ignore what she created, even if she was quickly overtaken by newer and better ships. There's a reason that the term Dreadnought is known the world over to represent a powerfully armed warship. Thank you for watching. And please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content and are interested in the development history video when I get that one out. See you in the next one.